This is my first presidential address to this synod, though I spoke informally at our last meeting in November, in the days before my enthronement. I'd like to thank all the dioceses for the generous welcome Susan and I have received. In the months since then, I've set myself three priorities. First, by visiting groups of clergy gathered in deaneries to check out whether the charge given to me by the Archbishop of Canterbury at the confirmation of my election has actually captured the challenges the diocese faces at this time. And in general, the response was that it had. But secondly, to get to know the diocese, its people and its terrain as quickly as possible. And to that end, I've been visiting parishes, schools, hospitals and other important institutions in the historic county of Lincolnshire. And I'm now visiting clergy in their homes and from Eastertide will be inviting clergy and lay people into the new bishop's house in Nettleham Road. But please be patient as this will take some time to get everyone in. Thirdly, to use the opportunity of these first few months to call the diocese back to some of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. On Wednesday, I was reminded of something of this when I attended the consecration of the new bishops of Croydon and Woolwich in Southwark Cathedral and was reminded of the, words of, the open, of the opening words of the service. Bishops are ordained to be shepherds of Christ's flock and guardians of the faith of the apostles, proclaiming the gospel of God's kingdom and leading his people in mission. They are to gather God's people and celebrate with them the sacraments of the new covenant. Thus formed into a single communion of faith and love, the Church in each place and time is united with the Church in every place and time. So in that spirit of Episcopal responsibility, I want to offer some reflections about the nature of the Church to you today. In fact, there are two important images the Church has used to describe itself, which evoke a tension between being static and dynamic. The Church as a city and the Church as a pilgrim people. Let's look at these images in turn. First, the church as a city. This is a very influential metaphor. In fact, St. Augustine of Hippo wrote a book called The City of God. And one scholar said, Christianity began in a garden, the Garden of Eden, and will end in a city, the city of heavenly peace. And Augustine evoked what he saw as the nature of the city of God, a city to which we are called in the fulfilment of all things at the completion of time. But the trouble was the church wanted to settle down and make itself comfortable, powerful and rich too soon and for the wrong reasons. When the Roman Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity in the 4th century, a period began in church history in which the church became established and powerful. It was identified with the state, it raised armies and fought wars and went on crusades. It became very wealthy. And of course many great things emerged from this time in our history, a period which lasted well over a thousand years. Our own Lincoln Cathedral and other great cathedrals and many of our parish churches were built, schools, universities and hospitals were, were established. And, it, and this period provided a common world view that inspired the creativity of writers and architects, composers and painters. But the church also became very stabilised, possibly too settled and too invested in the status quo. The church was so established that when thinkers came along who challenged the intellectual basis of the faith, from Galileo in the 17th century to Darwin, Marx and Freud in the 19th and 20th centuries, the Christian church in a sense pulled up the drawbridge. Rather than engage with new perspectives on truth, it re retrenched into the fortified city, only emerging occasionally to send out raiding parties against the secular world outside and quickly returning to the safety, the purity and disciplined life within the city. Sometimes I feel we belong to an organisation that even now is hiding behind the walls of its castellated city, hoping for the world to revert to how things used to be. What can be said of the church as a whole can be said also of the Anglican Communion. Without wishing to preempt the debate on the covenant and with gratitude to our external speakers, I suggest that we should avoid the temptation of trying to build and sustain relationships in a way based on rules and system. I've quoted before in reporter's speech the words of Michael Ramsey, but here they are again as he wrote them, in fact, in this diocese in the 1920s. The Anglican Church's credentials are its incompleteness with tension and travail in its soul. It's clumsy and untidy, it baffles neatness and logic, for it is sent not to commend itself as the best type of Christianity, but by its very brokenness to point to the universal Church wherein all have died, 
Hence its story can never differ from the story of Corinth, to which the Apostle wrote. Like Corinth, it has those of Paul, of Peter, of, of Apollos. Like Corinth, it has nothing it has not received. Like Corinth, it learns of unity through its nothingness before the cross of Christ. And like Corinth, it sees in the apostolate its dependence upon the one people of God and the death by which every member and every church bears witness to the body which is one. And so we come to the second image or metaphor, the church as a body of pilgrims. This is a very old way of describing the church and the life of an individual Christian. It appears not only in the scriptures but also in the great devotional literature like John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and for me more amusingly in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. It was the language the pilgrim fathers and mothers, many from this diocese, used to describe themselves when they set off to settle in what is now the United States. The language of pilgrimage tends to be used by people who feel less than settled where they are, who are at odds with the status quo and uncomfortable with the world as they see it. They seek something new. That was the motivation of the Israelites as they fled the oppression of Egypt to seek the land of promise and journeyed for 40 years to find that land. That was the motivation, as I say, of the pilgrim fathers and mothers who left their homeland to begin a new life characterised by Christian values where they felt they were, which they felt were not open to them at home. Two ways then of describing the church as a city and as a pilgrim people. How do these images resonate with where we are today? Clearly the period of fortified superiority and separateness within the city I described earlier has largely come to an end, certainly for us in Western Europe. The Church is beginning to recognise that it's called to a different relationship with the world, one characterised by openness and vulnerability. Like the very early Christians, those before the conversion of Constantine, the Church today is called into a hard place to engage with the world, but also because of our beliefs and values, to be at odds with the world, living as strangers in, in, in an alien land. St. Augustine described it like this, the church, like a pilgrim in a foreign land, pressing forward amid the persecutions of the world, announcing the cross and the death of the Lord until he comes. This means, like Christ himself, the church as a body and we as individual members of it are invited to leave the security of our fortified castle and to step out together into the world, not to identify with its values, but to play our part in transforming the world into God's kingdom. There's a great temptation to remain in the castle where we feel safe and valued, but just as God in Jesus Christ prepared the way for the salvation of the world by the risk, the openness and vulnerability of the Incarnation, so we can play our small part in preparing the way for its redemption by leaving the safety of our church to engage with the community around us. And rather than shouting at people over the battlements or even on a bad day pouring boiling oil over them, we are invited to lower our drawbridge and step out to engage with people in dialogue and work with others to build a kingdom of justice, peace and dignity for all people. And in doing this we are called to work with people of faith or other faiths or of no faith at all. This move, the move I've described of stepping out of the fortified church in order to be pilgrims travelling through the world and in order to play our part in its redemption, can be applied both to the traditional way of being the church as well as fresh expressions. I hope the discipleship programme next year will invite each Christian person in the diocese to journey as a pilgrim. It will invite us to ponder the Church and its place in the world, its strengths and its weaknesses. It will invite us prayerfully to look at the scriptures and history to see what we can learn from them about how to be the Church in our time, to step out of our churches to discover the needs of our communities and see how we can serve them better. For this to be authentic, it will necessarily involve openness and vulnerability. 
confidence and trust, humility and love. And with God's help, we can move forward together in this way. We can then become the faithful God body of pilgrims God is calling us to be. One final point. I hope the church of the future that we are moving towards will be different from the church of the last thousand years and perhaps closer to the primitive church in that it will be a church in which the role of the people of God, the laos, is recognised and developed. I'm hoping that we can become a church in which the laity are not regarded as second class and passive members of the church. One understanding of the church is of a great ocean liner journeying across the oceans of the world. The archbishop is the captain, the bishops are the officers, and the clergy are the, quote, able seamen. Archdeacons are probably engineer officers, in the words of Cardinal Avery Dulles, opening and closing the valves of grace, making sure that everything works. But in this understanding, where are the laity? They're the passengers, sitting passively on the deck, occasionally engaging in a game of deck coits, or trying the cocktail of the day. The understanding of the church reached its climax in the 19th century, and is now being replaced with the recovered understanding of the early church, in which the fundamental unit of Christian community is the company of the baptised people, and the primary sacrament of, is baptism rather than ordination. The documents of the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church include some wise words about the role of the laity. They, it describes the laity like this, that countless number of men and women busy at work in their daily life and activity, oftentimes far from view and quite unacclaimed by the world, unknown to the world's great personages, but nonetheless looked upon in love by the Father, untiring labourers who work in the Lord's vineyard, confident and steadfast through the power of God's grace. These are the humble yet great builders of the kingdom of God in history. All of us are meant to participate according to our gifts and according to the Church's order in God's love for the world as, a pre as expressed through his body, the Church. Such an understanding means that you and I are called to take more seriously our life as the baptised people of God. The non-ordained should not regard themselves merely as the passive recipients of the ministry of the clergy, but positively as the people of God who have a responsibility to minister in his world. So when we're concerned about the shortage of ordained ministers, we might see it not only as a God-given reminder of the need for more people to explore a vocation to the ordained ministry, but also a sign of the need for all of us to consider what gifts God is calling each one of us to offer for the ministry of his church and his world. The important roles of those who are ordained as deacon, priest and bishop are complementary to and deriving from the ministry of all God's people. There'll always be a church on earth until the time comes when the church on earth is subsumed into the mystical body of Christ in heaven. The mission of the church will always be the same, to be Christ's body in the world, called to worship God and motivated by the Eucharist, sent out to discover and reveal God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But what form the church of the future will take, we don't know, God knows. We can trust, however, in his power and love. That God who brought light and life in the resurrection and made us by his spirit, the Easter people, will bring all his children to be with him forever.